Okay, um, hello again. Um, sorry for having all this colour management stuff this morning. I'm supposed to be like half asleep, ready for lunch. Uh, I'm Richard Hughes, if you didn't see my previous presentation about Colour Hug. Uh, and this is about Colour D and basically what we've done in the last year and kind of what we want to do in the next couple of years. So I guess it makes sense now to sort of clarify what a CMM and all these kind of like, words that you hear people banding around that you don't actually know what they mean. CMM is one of those horribly overloaded words that mean lots of different things to lots of different people. So I've kind of tried to work out some nomenclature so that we can call things in, different, in the proper ways, or my proper way, or a way that makes sense to me. So in this case I've called a colour management framework, is the thing that kind of applications ask questions for, it doesn't actually do any pixel conversion, and a colour management engine I've kind of defined as the thing that actually converts red to magenta or blue to cyan and this kind of thing. So CMM is kind of like an abstract thing that's not particularly useful. Um, Colour D is kind of, I guess, in competition with Aranos. It's kind of like a competing framework. It does a lot less than Aranos, um, but I'll come to some more details later. So this is the architecture we've been working on for the last, I guess, year and a, year and a half, I guess. Uh, Colour D is a system daemon in the system context. Um, it talks to SANE, UDEV, CUPS, also registers devices with Colour D and uh, CUPS then uses Colour D to get the correct profile for a document based on paper and this kind of stuff. I'll come to more later. It also talks to colour sensors so we can access stuff like the Colour Hug or, or, or Huey or Colour Monkey, etc. using native drivers rather than having to screen scrape Argyle so much. It's also got configuration files, a couple of random databases, and it also reads all the profiles, the ICC profiles and uses home in, in the system directories. So things like common profiles like Adobe RGB, Profoto RGB, all the ones you might want to share with people. But because Colour D is in the system context, it can't access anything in the user's home directory, kind of like a layering type, um, SE Linux type, file permission type problems. And so it requires a session helper. Now for GNOME we use a GNOME settings daemon plugin, which all that really does is it goes through the user's home directory, looks for anything that looks like an ICC profile, and registers it through Colour D. This lets things like CUPS use profiles in the home directory that the system daemon wouldn't otherwise have had access to. Also, XORG we can't use from the system context either because it's, uh, it's running as a different user, it's a different uh, logical context. And so we have XORG registers, uh, we register devices, display devices, through the session into Colour D. And then we also have two, th two other programs. GCM Viewer is kind of like a colour geek tool if, you're sort of, if you want to know what an ICC profile looks like um, in 3D and all this kind of crazy stuff. And we've also got what users will actually use, which is GNOME Control Center, which is where they can assign profiles to devices and set up defaults and that kind of thing. So I guess the main thing you can take from this now, Colour D is shipped by practically every distribution. Colour D in the last year has been adopted by um, Fedora, SUSE, Debian, Ubuntu. And now, I guess the key message to take from this is that as an application designer or a framework designer, you can kind of rely on color management being there and kind of working, as opposed to before where GIMP had a little tick box to let you enable color management and choose a profile. Now we can say that GIMP actually can just depend on color D and get the color profile automatically without the user having to enable or choose or configure anything. Um, I guess because Colour D doesn't do as much as some of the other frameworks like Aranos, it means that it's much easier to ship for distributions. It's also got like uh, different libraries, and I'll, I'll explain more, more in the detail. But what, one of the benefits of having it by default means that we can switch distributions and uh, desktops use it by default. So for GNOME 3.4, it was a big sort of feature that colour management switched on by default and ready to go. So you can see the top left, we have a little sort of colour icon. And this meant that users basically could double click an ICC profile and have it installed to the display profile without actually having to configure or edit files in Vim and all this kind of crazy stuff. But actually it could just work. So not to be outdone, um, Daniel has been working for the last couple of months on the KDE um, control panel and session instance as well as we've had for GNOME for the last couple of years. Um, this is the Color D KDE control module which is in KDE somewhere. And this basically shows the list of devices and you can choose some profiles. This is his system. Similarly, you can see information about the profiles, see any metadata. And I guess critically, there's a little button 
Um, this is the KDE version, so it's like different. It's called install system wide, and that lets the user copy the profile out of their home directory into something in this uh, user sh uh, user lib or something, so that it can be used when they're not logged in. So if you have a display profile that you say, okay, this profile I want to be used for all users in the system, it could be that your home directory is encrypted, in which case we haven't access to them until the user's logged in. So by installing this, by clicking this button, we can install it system wide and have it for all users by default. Similarly for printers, if you install a printer profile per user, you might want to use it when other users are logged in as well. Um, this button it kind of uh, hides quite a lot of complexity behind the button. You click the button and you get a policy kit authentication dialog, which allows you to do a privileged operation, like copying a file from the home directory to the system directory. Um, but I'll come to more issues with that in a minute. And Daniel's also copied a lot of the features we've got with like the, the named color support in ICC profiles, which makes it an awful lot easier to kind of see key things in profiles if you're not a color geek. You can go through and you can kind of do, these, I think these are the uh, crayon colors for the different uh, Crayola color, cut colors. Um, so yeah, it, it's kind of like a nice power user tool. If you're a bit of a color geek, you might use this tool. So in the last year, Color D has had, I guess, what, two and a half people working on it um, pretty much regularly. But this graph hides a lot of the detail. In the last six months, we've had 30 people commit code, <coughs> maybe only one or two patches, excluding translators. So we've had a lot of people who've come in, made a couple of changes, said, okay, well, Color D doesn't work with my application. Here's the patch to fix it. And they go back to doing their application. So we've had quite a lot of uh, interest from people who actually started using Color D and actually either find a bug or find something that it needs to do that they'd wanted to do, etc. And you can see as, as a project, it's kind of leveling out. And it's kind of stable now. I don't see there being much more churn with how Color D works. Interestingly, when the Color D KDE uh, module was added, we only actually had to add one method, which is due to, I guess, um, not enough forethought on my, thought, on my part due to the uh, limitations of the Qt dbus bindings. But apart from that, Daniel basically copied the design from GNOME and did it all in about, I think it took about two months, which is not bad considering he's got a full-time job and two young kids. In the last year, we've also worked out that client programs will need to use the API. Now this is, uh, the libcolord is a glib GIO library. So it's quite a high, le high level library. It's got full cancellation, uh, asynchronous, uh, and thread safe. Um, we've been adding documentation. But because it's a glib GIO library, we can do this quite cool thing called GIR. Now, if you create the GIR from a glib library, that allows you to do some pretty cool stuff you can automatically create Python bindings. So I didn't actually write any of these Python bindings. They're all automatically created from the uh, glib, libcolord binding. So you can see here, in about nine lines of code, I've gone through and I've imported some stuff. I've, created, I've connected to the daemon itself. I've asked the daemon to find me the device that has a, a random property called XR and R name of LPDS1, which is my internal panel. I've connected to it asynchronously because it's async doing stuff sync is not a great idea when you're using GUI code, but this is fine because it's a script. I'm then getting the default profile. I'm connecting to the profile to get details about it. And then I'm writing the file name. Now each profile and device has like 20 or 30 properties that are kind of useful. And this is an example of where you might use it. If, you, if you're doing it something like um, uh, uh, Metacity or something, we actually want to know what profile to use for a different screen. But it's kind of cool. But a lot of proprietary people either don't want to have a GIR dependency or don't want to link in with an LGPL or GPL library. So ColorD also has a Dbus interface. Now Dbus interface doesn't require any linking. So all these sort of languages can access Dbus natively. So that in the same way that you have the, um, the uh, GIR example in Python, it's just a few more lines to either use libdbus or do it basically completely, completely uh, you do your own thing. It's very easy to use dbus without any binding at all. Which means that applications written in C Sharp or Ruby or local applications in PHP can do this very simple thing of saying, what color profile should I use when I'm printing something on plain paper with RGB ink at 300 dpi. Something that's really simple. We can give the programs the ability to ask this directly without having to ask the user. This isn't a complicated thing we need to ask the user. This, should, this stuff should just work. Now, 
In the last year, we've also changed Color D from running as root. Now, a lot of people went, oh my god, you run Color D as root. What about if it got hacked? And I agree, it, was, it wasn't ideal. The only reason we were running it as root because the authentication framework, policy kit, wouldn't actually let us check our own authentications if we weren't root. So the Ubuntu security team made the changes to a policy kit that we needed. And consequently, the SUSE security team then patched Color D to run as a Color D user which is great, which means that worst case scenario, if someone hacks Color D, finds a vulnerability in something like LCMS2 or something like that, then all they can do is read the color profiles on the system or utter worst case scenario, change someone else's color profile. So it's not a complete disaster. And you might also notice that another process in that list called Color D-Sane. Now, if you look at the bug list for Color D, it's kind of horrific. If you look, you go through in the last year and say, okay, find me all the bugs in Color D. Most of them are crashes. Now, when a framework code crashes, it's really bad because if Color D crashes, your display goes back to being uncalibrated and changes color. Your printing dialog no longer works, etc. And it's kind of pretty fatal. So I did a bit of digging, and it basically turns out that 99.7 or whatever of these bugs were actually crashes in libsane. Nothing to do with Color D at all. So obviously. I can't have a dodgy libsane driver, which is, for instance, like the brother drivers are proprietary and they plug into libsane and they're just, just awful. Um, so I, I couldn't have the libsane taking out color D and taking out a core bit of the color infrastructure um, in, a, in a desktop. So I split off color D, all the libsane stuff into a separate process called color D-sane, which is bad because it's an extra process, but good because if libsane sort of goes for a walk and crashes, it automatically gets auto-started by Color D, and nothing other than seeing the list of scanners disappear for a split second and then reappear. It's not actually a disaster. It's a complete workaround, and if we had the time and the motivation, it makes sense to create something like a sane D or something. Now, I know there's a session about doing something like that uh, on Friday, um, and it'd be great to sort of work out a way of wrapping sane with the Dbus interface and fixing sane so it's not so kind of crashy. Now I've got rid of the color, the libsane integration with the um, lib. Now I've removed the libsane dependency on the core daemon. These crashes have disappeared, and I'm not sure there's been a bug reported for Crasher since I've changed it to use the external helper. So it's kind of a workaround, but kind of a required workaround in this case. Incidentally, we need the same uh, support so that applications like EasyScan and GNOME Scan can say what color profile do I use for this scanner. So it's kind of more so that it everything sort of linked up type uh, uh, workflow. Now I guess we come to what's ne next. What, what's the plan? Now this is Wayland. Now Wayland's had a lot of hype and there's a lot of things that it isn't and a lot of things that it is. But really all you need to know is that it's the next generation kind of X server, you could call it replacement, you could call it a supervisor, you can call it all sorts of stuff. But really Wayland's here and it's coming fast. Within a couple of years I think distributions will be running Wayland by default. Now with X, we never really got a chance of doing any kind of real color correction. We got a chance to upload a 2D gamma ramp, which lets us do some kind of pretty crap uh, temperature adjustment, but that's really it. But we couldn't actually do full screen color management. We certainly couldn't do full screen color management without having to use lots of complicated atoms and using compares and all this kind of other stuff. So really what I wanted it to do was have Wayland support with color management, full screen color management, with toolkit support, pretty much running out the box. So in the last couple of months, I've been working with the Wayland guys, basically working out a way to do this. Now, Wayland's core problem is that it, well, Wayland treats every single window as its smallest part, so that you, you can have one window, which might be this kind of window, this big thing, um, as one color space, and another window as another color space. That's obviously not ideal. If you have a viewer like I have GNOME or Krita or something, you might only want one widget to have a custom color space of some sort of embedded JPEG color profile. You actually want all the rest to be the sRGB default of the toolkit. So what we actually need to do is have two places of integration in Wayland, one being so that it does the screen correction per output, so you can have multi-monitors with different profiles, and also have inbuilt toolkit support so that you can have buttons in sRGB but have a widget with a like, a, like an image display widget with a custom color space. And this is kind of where the complexity is. And we haven't really worked this one out yet, but we have kind of done full screen. This is a custom profile through custom uh, um, 
color spaces. And all it really does is change every single color to the opposite, basically showing that we can do full screen color management with Wayland, but without the crucial toolkit support. I don't think without the toolkit support, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense. It doesn't give us much other than to be able to do more than the, um, uh, the temperature adjustment. But I think with toolkit support, right from the very start of people rolling out Wayland will make it really important for QT uh, um, and KDE, uh, sorry, QT and GTK apps to be color managed out of the box. Now, I mentioned this just works thing. Just works is kind of important for me. I'm, I'm a GNOME guy, so I, I kind of dislike complexity and quite like things magically working. And this is what we've been doing with metadata. Now, We've mentioned the metadata before about things we can actually add to the ICC profile. It's not actually useful for actually rendering different colors, but it is useful for a color management framework, CMF, to use to do magic things. So if, say, this is the profile I've created for my printer using a, a photo spectrometer, got a kind of expensive little gadget. And here I've added three bits of information about that profile, which helps us later. So I've said that the mapping device ID is the exact printer ID of what it's created. Now having a mapping device ID means that I can send this profile to, I don't know, my, my, my wife or my parents who share the same printer. Like me, my, my wife and I have two laptops and we share a printer by unplugging the cable and plugging it back in a different laptop. So I could send the profile, double click on it, and with that tiny bit of metadata, all she has to do is double click and add it to her user, add, uh, import it and it automatically adds itself as the default profile for the printer if she hasn't already set one up. So it kind of makes things just work. Similarly, when we, when we actually created this profile, I chose to print with RGB emulation on glossy paper at 600 dpi. Now, if we know that at calibration time, it makes perfect sense to put it in the profile so that when I double click that profile and import it onto someone else's computer, it automatically assigns itself for the printer for this print condition. Go for it. Yeah. Yep. Okay, well, um, Color D got the databases I mentioned initially. The databases store hard, what I call hard mapping. So where the user has said, use this profile for that. That's always respected. The only time that this is, this is what I call a soft mapping, is where the user hasn't actually specified something manually. So if the user's, like my wife knows nothing about color, and so she hasn't said, okay, actually, I have two types of glossy paper. I only use this profile for that glossy paper. Um, so this only counts if the user hasn't actually overridden it before. If it goes, we actually specify a fallback scheme. So the first thing this will do is, if, if, if I only have one, if I double click the profile now and have no other color profiles, and I'm printing on plain paper at 300 dpi, the first thing Color D will say, uh, first thing Cups will say to Color D is, do you have anything that matches RGB.glossy.600? Color D will say no. Okay, what about RGB.glossy.anything? And Color D says no. He says, okay, what about RGB? anything, anything, and Color D says, yes, here's the profile you should use. So it's kind of a fallback scheme. It's not perfect, and a lot of people, that's not precise enough for what they want to do, which is why I included the mapping format, which is basically says, this is the this is the format of the qualifier. So this lets us specify anything else. So instead of having the three um, color space, uh, paper type, resolution, which is just the default in my PPD for my printer, which also is instantly what Apple uses for color sync, we could, have a, we could have five things. Rather than having a RGB glossy 600 dpi, we could have RGB glossy 600 dpi dot Tuesday uh, dot that um, dot afternoon or faking or something. You're completely going to have arbitrary stuff because when you, speci when you um, ask for the qualifier from Color D and Cups, you specify this fallback um, star system. Go for it. Sure. The qualifier here is literally just the uh, PPD default um, color keywords, the three color keywords, and that's it. This is really just, a, is not so much designed to store what the user wants to do. This is storing what the user had when they calibrated. You see? So it's kind of like the, this is, the, this is, what, this is what they produced the profile on, rather than this is what the user wants to use the profile for. It could be we use that if the user has nothing better set up. It does let us do some kind of 
Sure. This this is no this is no way perfect because, like you say, it depends whether you want HP lip or Guten print or whatever. Um, and I guess you could add to this. You could have RGB glossy 600 DPI dot Guten print. There's no reason why it has to be three dotted notation like there is in color sync. You know, that's this is really, really saying. So yeah, it would make sense, I guess, in this case to have color space dot media type resolution dot driver as default because we can have as much detail as we want. Um, again, this is like all. This is just what I've done. This idea is better ideas welcome. Um, yes, that's only that's only because it's hard coded in. There's no need for it to be in that order. But I've specified color space, paper type, resolution as default. And but then it really that's only what most printers come up with. Some printers have different color keywords, obviously. So some printers might have um, uh, the the resolution, which is much more important than the um, paper type, which might mean they've put the color keywords all the way around. So then it becomes the right priority. So it's kind of relying on. Exactly. So it's really relying on the PPD vendor, the person that wrote the PPD, to understand what's most important for that printer. So it's kind of a semi-sane assumption. Um, yeah. It color keywords. Normal black. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which is kind of critical because that black is going to be a very different profile. Um, so. This lets us um, show something like this. This is the default GTK um, print preview. Now, OS X does something slightly different where you can have, well, imagine color management settings are like a tube. Well, in OS X, you can change the one end of the tube, which is assigning profiles per devices. And the other end of the tube is kind of what profile do I want to use for this print run, etc. And it's kind of changing things in two places, which leads you to be in a situation where you're not really sure what profile is going to be used. What if, what if the settings disagree, or what, what if the user doesn't, isn't aware of certain profiles being used for certain things? So in the GTK print preview, I've kind of done a simple solution, which basically says only show the user what profile would be used for these settings. So if I change my output mode to gray, this will change to Cully Monkey, brackets gray, HP Photo Smart 109, whatever. So it changes, so it lets me see for a given set of settings what profile would be used. So if I, want, if I wanted plain paper and this profile is set up so that it only works on glossy, this would say no color profile available. You know, so it's, it's quite a flexible system, but it relies on the user setting the color management stuff up only in the color control panel rather than trying to do it all in the print, in the print dialog. I get a nod, that's good. Another thing we've looked at this year is trying to replicate how the user's calibrated. So when I calibrate my screen with a, a color hug, Huey, whatever, I might calibrate it when it's 80% um, brightness, which corresponds to a certain luminosity. Now, color geeks get quite upset because when you change the um, brightness setting on your computer, the colors change. And it's only valid for a certain sort of range. So what we started doing now is we're encoding into the profile itself what was the um, brightness of the screen when this profile was created. So when the profile is loaded at, at session start, it automatically sets the panel brightness to be that uh, exact brightness. But it does let you change it. Yep. Yep. So yeah, all, all, all of that modified, created, all of that. That's all in the standard ICC metadata. Um, the only disadvantage with this is due to the way uh, X kind of works, X is all single threaded and can't do uh, external I squared C communication with external monitors, so you can't do DDCCI, and it's, it's kind of crap that we can only change the brightness of internal panels. With Wayland, Wayland isn't, respected to, uh, isn't um, restricted to a single thread, so we can start using DDCCI to change the brightness of external panels to do this kind of thing um, on external panels as well as LCD panels, as internal panels. So that's kind of where we're heading. Um, at the moment, this is we're just storing a percentage value, which is not great, but, but we can, from the colorimeter, actually get the absolute luminosity of the screen at calibration time. It much more useful, but yeah, exactly. But then they have to you have to work out the luminosity of their screen for a given percentage. Yeah, yes, you can do it. Um, go for it. Um, I don't think many people are that anal. I'm not that anal about colour, so I don't think many people... I think most people 
um, when they use their laptop for like, I don't know, designing stuff and they're in a room like this, they dim it down a bit and they're fully aware that the colours are going to be kind of 90%, 99% okay. And for that extra, like, it's tiny variance. But for a lot of, for a lot of colour geeks, it's kind of, as long as you've got the right setup, that's kind of encouraging you to stick at that brightness if you want to stay at where you calibrated it before. But. Yeah, network's really hard because when you have a cup server, you literally have, you send it a, 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 um, a, J, a, 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 a .pdf file and that's it, you kind of leave it to it. What I've kind of suggested with that is the print server has ColorD installed. So when you send it a PDF, we, you can embed kind of information in that to kind of get it to choose the right thing. In that situation where you're sharing a print like an office, I don't think many people care that specific profiles are used for specific things because most office printers have got a uh, random white paper in and they're basically black and white. So I'm not sure it's a huge use case. For that I'd like to see some of the um, like embedding the information into the PDF itself. But I'll explain, I've got another slide and I'll, I'll explain in a minute. So this is kind of the list of metadata. This is the metadata we share, some of which with Aranos, some of which with um, this Cal GUI. It's really a geeky list that you never need to know, but behind the scenes, all this extra stuff lets us do all the clever stuff. So if you see random stuff in your ICC profile as metadata, this is kind of what we're using it for. Different accuracies, screen brightness, all that kind of thing. And this is a, um, a specification I've stuck up on the, uh, in the ColorD Git. It's, it's, it's pretty dull. For you mean brightness for panel brightness or yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't. It, it doesn't right now. It doesn't right now, but there's no reason why not. The only thing we have to sort of work out more is how do we specify an accuracy? Like for instance, at the two at the bottom, I've got gamut volume and gamut coverage. So gamut volume is, um, for instance, in reference to sRGB. So you could say that Adobe RGB is as a metric, say 1.2 the size of sRGB. So most people, that's kind of enough. To us, possibly not. And similarly, we can have gamut coverage, which in the dollar X could be replaced with sRGB. So you could say this, this printer profile that I've got can print 100% of sRGB, but only 88% of Adobe RGB. So it's a fairly useful metric for end users, not terrifically useful if you're a colour scientist or a pre-press engineer or something, but for most people knowing that actually, yeah, I can print all the colours in this document is quite a useful property. Agree? Sure, indeed. Uh, and there's loads of stuff like, we, we're going to add loads more metadata, because metadata is essentially free. Each metadata key adds like 1k to the file size. It's kind of trivial. So I think it makes a lot more sense adding lots of metadata to the file at calibration time or from the user, asking the user questions at calibration time. Because then you can do all this clever stuff, like choosing the most accurate profile, just by changing how it works in the background. Without actually having to use the, the user's particular little box or whatever, you know, make some sane decisions. Um, now this is the, uh, where did I put this slide here? Oh yes, so basically if, you, if you're a bit all confused about this colour stuff, this is the default um, colour control panel in GNOME 3.2 and 3.4. And here you can see just like a list of devices, my printer, there's a, um, there's a, a display that I'm running. Um, it tells you when the calibration was done, so if it's, if you can also set um, gconf keys. Now, these, are, these are disabled by default. But if you're someone like Pixar or DreamWorks or something, it's kind of critical that your color profile is less than a couple of years old. They, they reprofile every few months. And so you can have a notification to come up with GNOME 3, which will say, your color profile is three months old. Click here to recalibrate, which is kind of a big thing for a lot of studios, but not the sort of thing that the GNOME guys want it turned on by default, because most people just don't care. Um, if you are more interested in this color stuff, it is kind of complicated, but I've tried to write some documentation about how it all works, how to change stuff, and certainly how to test stuff, because if you can't test what's happening in the background, you're not sure whether this color management thing is actually working or just a complete little hot air. So if you notice there's a, on the dialog, there's a, a learn more um, little click, and that will bring up a um, help document with about 
I think it's got about 30 pages of how to test color management, um, what it's all about, what's the point, where do I get profiles from, and that kind of thing. Now I'm running a bit behind, so I've probably got time for one or two questions. So thanks very much for listening, and any questions? <laughs> questions? Go for it. Yeah, it's like um, any bit of calibration. If you go and buy an oscilloscope from a hardware store, you have to get it recalibrated every few years. And if you're in a defense contractor, that's really important. If you're the sort of person that's just seeing if something's 5 volts or 10 volts, it's not important at all. In the same way that if you uh, chose slightly the wrong red, you probably wouldn't lose your job. But if you're designing like a movie, for, like Pixar or DreamWorks, it's kind of critical. And that is, you would lose your job if you chose a color that was too red. It wasn't, or, or Red Riding Hood was wearing a pink coat, you know, it's kind of critical. So it depends how kind of colour anal you want to be. I don't. I, I, I just buy stuff and if it's 99% correct, it's good enough for me. I think you used to be able to send them away to be recalibrated. I don't think the Huey they do anymore because they've discontinued actually making them. Um, so I don't think you can anymore. Um, and also for a device that only costs $100, it's not worth their while in kind of shipping, support, etc. If you buy something more expensive, like a Color Monkey, like $800, you can get those recalled. Um, yeah, I believe so. Oh, really? There's no Cal certificate with a Color Monkey. That sounds more right, listen to him. Um, so, it's, yeah, so if you're going to spend $3,000 on a bit of equipment, yes. If you're going to buy $100 worth, we know. Um, so that's the, I guess it's true with a ruler or anything, any sort of measuring equipment, you know? Um, answered? Any more questions? Go for it. That one? Yes, so behind the background, there's in, in X, if you're using X rather than Wayland, there's an atom that's set called underscore ICC profile, which is basically the entire ICC profile blitted up to the X server. So all the app has to do is grab that atom from, um, from color D, and then you have the profile available. That kind of doesn't work so well on multi-monitors. So I'm kind of, if you're a display server, something, something like Wayland or something like um, Western or something, I prefer it if you went through, if you first, I guess the logical thing to do would be talk to Color D, ask, say, what profile should I use under this condition? Because you have a full up GBUS API you can use with queries and filters and all kind of stuff. Then, if that doesn't exist or it's not configured, look at underscore ICC profile, which is kind of what a few things have been doing for a few years, but it's not super powerful and it's not a great way of doing it, in my opinion. And then, if that doesn't exist, assume sRGB. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to have a little tick box and GIMP to say enable color management because no one's quite sure what that does. You know, people don't check that for fun. It should be there should be no checkbox at all. It should automatically all be come straight through from color D and have no UI whatsoever. Yeah, sure. Nobody knows what that does. Some, sometimes things change. Sometimes they don't. And having that checkbox means that you don't assume that there's color management present. Now with GNOME three, we can say actually color D does exist, it will be there by default. So there's no need to have the user opt in to something as random as color management. Uh, cool. Any more questions? Sure. I guess what you're trying to do is internal panel probably is probably what's called a six-bit panel. So it's kind of crappy, l l the cheapest panel they can buy for the, at the time. And your external panel is probably either eight or maybe even twelve-bit, and it's going to have a much higher gamut. So you can display many more colours. You can display like yellows on that screen that you could never display on this screen. 
Um, now, if you want to make them match, it's the same thing as having, say, if you've got like a, a, a little uh, GM Corsa, a little shitty car, and then you've got a Ferrari, and you want them both to have the same performance. Now, your only choice is make the Ferrari drive like a Corsa. You've got no other option. You have to make the, the best car drive like the worst car. Otherwise, they're going to have different performances. So, what you can't really do is say, make, make the good screen look like, uh, sorry, make the bad screen look like the good screen, because it's not physically possible. The, 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 the dyes in the monitor and the, the, the primaries are in a different physical place. It can't produce those colours ever. So to make it actually match, you've got to say, okay, we're going to sacrifice that for that, which a lot of people don't want to do. So what I would advise in that case is say, have this screen as your primary screen, and say, this screen is colour managed, ignore that one completely. You know? Does that make sense? Well, in which case you have to make them both look crap. No, we don't support that. We could support that with full screen color management because we there's only because with without full screen color management you only have like a two D gamma ramp, so you can only really change the color temperature. You can't say make this primary look like this primary. With the Wayland idea, yes, you could, but then you're going to have a display that kind of they both look a bit rubbish. Get a better laptop. <laughs> What, what make? God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As long as the, I think most people notice the colour temperature difference. So one looks like redder or bluer than the other. Like LCDs on like ThinkPads, for instance, are really blue. They're so what we call cold. And so if you can like warm them up a little bit using the 2D gamma ramps, they look a lot better than in some random. D45 type, really cold um, aluminum. Um, it's really hard to do manually. You, you could do it if you had a spectrophotometer. Could you do it with a colorimeter? Not sure you can. You just take the primary. I think you'd need a $800 piece of equipment to do it. Um, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.